Tonight, all the day's major stories here on Prime. A fifth hostage transfer between Israel and Hamas takes place as talks are said to be underway to further extend the truce. Plus... And, and it's so, not that the sea level wouldn't have slowly overtaken it. It's just that it's been happening ex incredibly fast, yeah? It's that it's been happening incredibly fast and that we have so little of this precious resource. Ghost forests are one of the most striking indicators of climate change. We take you to one in our own backyard for a look at what they are and why we could see more of them as climate change is felt around the world. And... There's a half-blood Aboriginal child out here somewhere. Run! I thought we might put him in the good hands of the church. Get off my... 15 years after the release of his epic romance, Australia, Baz Luhrmann is back with Nicole Kidman and Hugh Jackman. We sit down with a prolific director as he takes us to faraway downs. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the winter weather blast hitting millions as the coldest air of the season sets in. Plus, they're one of the most powerful conservative groups in Republican politics, and they've just endorsed someone other than Donald Trump, who the Koch-backed Americans for Prosperity just endorsed for 2024 and why. And it was the biggest single shopping day of the year, the billions spent to the number of Americans using buy now, pay later, and the implications for the future as the dust settles on Cyber Monday. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we begin with that tentative pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas and the 12 additional hostages freed today. 10 of them are Israelis, two foreign nationals, one a minor, the rest all women. And on the Israeli side, the government released 30 more Palestinian prisoners prisoners as we get images of celebrations in the West Bank. Tonight, with nine Americans still reportedly being held hostage, U.S. officials say there's no indication Hamas is using the Americans as leverage. And the White House says 54,000 pounds of aid was delivered by plane to Egypt today, which will ultimately make its way into Gaza. Then two more planes will follow. Even with the pause in fighting, the situation inside Gaza remains dire. Roughly two million people have now been displaced. And tonight, there's some hope more hostages will be released. We begin with our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, on the ground for us once again in Tel Aviv. Tonight, Hamas militants walking each of those 12 hostages to the Red Cross, among them 17-year-old Mia Leemberg, seen here clutching her pet dog, Bella, both surviving captivity together. Mia kidnapped along with her mother, Gabriella, seen here tonight holding each other close. The women, at least one in a wheelchair, carefully loaded into those Red Cross vehicles, which then squeezed through crowds near Gaza's border with Egypt, then driven into Israel. In exchange, Israel releasing 30 more Palestinians from its jails. Notably missing again tonight, any Americans. The FBI believes nine citizens are still in captivity in Gaza, including two women, and no word on where they're being held or which group is holding them. Tonight, CIA Director Bill Burns holding high-level talks in Qatar, pushing for a hostage deal, including Americans. In Israel, emotional reunions like Thomas Hand's hug of his daughter Emily, <laughs> followed by the trauma. Tonight, Thomas telling CNN, Emily cries herself to sleep and thought she was in captivity for a year. The most shocking, disturbing part of the meeting was um, she was just whispering. Mm. I had to put my ear on her lips, like this close, and say, what did you say? And I thought you were kidnapped. She didn't know what the hell happened apart from that morning. So she's presumed everyone's kidnapped or killed or slaughtered or she had no idea. In Tel Aviv tonight, a rally, balloons lofted skyward, demanding the release of the two youngest hostages, 10-month-old Kfir, 4-year-old Aviv, and their mother, Shiri Bibas, seen here being taken captive on October 7th. And like every hostage family every night, Shiri's cousin, Yafat Zaylor Paz, gets a call from the IDF telling her whether those babies are on the list. And he calls me a few times a day, and I can't breathe. Even just to update on other things, and I can't breathe. No one's seen or heard from them, but Yifat's still hopeful for their release. Do you know what you're going to tell her? How much I love her. I think it go, it's going to be hard to let go for a minute there. Um, I'm going to tell her that I'm sorry it took so long to get her out. 
Glad to hear they are back at home. Let's get right to Matt in Tel Aviv. Matt, uh, what can you tell us about the negotiations to extend this pause in fighting in order to allow more hostages to be freed? They're centered in Doha, Lindsay, and they are round the clock, as we understand it. Uh, Egypt, Qatar, uh, obviously the U.S. involved, the head of the Israeli Secret Service is there, the Mossad. Um, and we understand that the U.S. is trying to extend the talks. Israel has said that it would be amenable to that. Hamas obviously, sig obviously signaling the same thing. And America at this point and U.S. envoys are hoping to include some of those American citizens. Nine of them are believed to still be held in Gaza by the FBI. Now, the White House is saying it does not think that Hamas is trying to use those American citizens as leverage, but the fact is at this point only a single American has been released so far, that four-year-old Abigail Adan. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman reporting once again from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. For more on these hostages being released, Joel Simon, the director of the Journalism Protection Initiative at CUNY's Newmark Journalism School, joins us now. Mr. Simon, thank you for your time. Uh, your reporting has looked at the hostage negotiations being brokered now by Qatar, Egypt, and the U.S., and in particular, the outsized role played by the small Gulf nation of Qatar. Uh, what is the status of these ongoing negotiations, and how did Qatar become so indispensable in this process? Well, Qatar has sort of positioned itself as the mediator of choice. They sometimes sort of refer to themselves as the, the, the Switzerland of the Gulf, and uh, they've made it a point for, uh, in terms of their own, uh, increasing their own influence and visibility in the region to be able to talk to all parties. And they host the political office uh, of Hamas in Doha, and they have relationships with the Israelis. So they were in the ideal position to be the go-between. And uh, they, they, they sort of began this process soon after the hostages were taken. Uh, on October 7th, they had actually had an initial deal in place, a kind of tentative agreement uh, on October 23rd. That later fell apart, but the the deal was finally uh, achieved, and uh, we're seeing uh, you know the, the release of uh, 50 hostages so far. And the deal Qatar has announced the deal has now been extended for two more days. So we'll see what what happens after that. You're also the author of "We Want to Negotiate: The Secret World of Kidnapping, Hostages, and Ransom," and you've written that while taking hostages is a violation of international humanitarian law, it's also increasingly common in modern warfare. Uh, there was a time when it was U.S. policy not to to negotiate with terror groups. What's changed? Is this now a, a necessary evil? Well, the, the, officially the policy hasn't changed at all, but I think you're see, what you're seeing is a more pragmatic interpretation of the policy. And, uh, uh, you know, formally the U.S. is not a, a party to the negotiations, but the reality is that hostage crises are resolved through negotiations. It's a, it's a terrible crime. As you say, it's a, it's a violation of international humanitarian law. Uh, but usually the only way to resolve them is through some sort of negotiations, uh, and that's what's taken place here. Qatar has sort of positioned itself uh, as the mediator with the ability to kind of t talk to all parties and broker this deal. Uh, but that's just the reality of, of um, hostage taking. And you're right, it's become a feature of modern warfare, uh, and this conflict is, is no different. And we've also seen reporting that many of the Palestinian prisoners that have been released were actually not charged with crimes but had been detained. Does that play into the hostage calculus as well? I don't think so. I mean, I think the Israelis sort of put forward um, uh, prisoners who they felt were uh, more palatable from their perspective. Uh, these are uh, women and minors to create some sort of a parallel with the, uh, the the hostages who are being released by Hamas, who are also uh, women and children. Uh, but I think the real, and, and it's also very common that uh, Palestinians are detained, large numbers of Palestinians, and they are held in this kind of uh, legal limbo, this kind of administration, administrative detention. So um, I think, you know, when the Israelis identified uh, the Palestinians who they were willing to release, many of them uh, uh, had this status. What are you hearing about the mood of the negotiations, and how do you expect to see this all play out ultimately? All I know is that, you know, there are high-level uh, discussions still going on in Qatar. 
Uh, there is a, a hope that there might be some framework to continue extending um, the ceasefire to see more hostages released, more humanitarian aid uh, uh, arrive in Gaza. So it's obviously been a grim uh, conflict with so many deaths. Uh, so it's it's po obviously positive to see uh, some 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 of the hostages released and humanitarian aid getting to the people of Gaza who have been suffering tremendously. Joel Simon, director of the Journalism Protection Initiative at CUNY's Newmark Journalism School. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Now to the fallout here at home where Iranian-backed hackers have claimed responsibility for a cyber attack on a water system near Pittsburgh. Here's our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, evidence that hackers with ties to Iran may be testing the American infrastructure for vulnerabilities. Officials at a small water utility site in Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, noticed Friday night that a computer that helps control water pressure for two townships was malfunctioning. When they rebooted the system, this ominous message, highlighted in red, appeared on the screen, saying, you have been hacked. One strategy used by hacking groups is to start small, target a vulnerable location, and then use that to conduct additional cyber attacks in the future. The group claiming responsibility called themselves Cyber Avengers, saying they were attacking because the water utility used equipment made in Israel. It's mind blowing. I would have never, in, my, in a million years, I would have never thought that we could be involved in that. Utility officials say the hack did not impact the main computer network and at no time was water quality or supply at risk. But tonight, ABC News obtaining this bulletin from state and federal officials warning that this form of attack has the potential to target any critical infrastructure in our area. A lot of concern here. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, what do we know about this Iranian cyber group? Well, we know they uh, supposedly have ties to the Iranian government, and they claim that they've attacked a number of water treatment facilities in Israel during this conflict with Hamas. So U.S. officials are taking this seriously, looking for other vulnerabilities in other areas while they, where they might be probing, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas. For us. Thanks so much, Pierre. Depending on where you live, if you step outside tonight, it certainly may feel like winter is upon us. We are tracking the first major lake effect snow of the season and temperatures have plunged for millions. In Lake County, Ohio, it is not a night to be on the roads. More than a dozen vehicles involved in a massive pileup in heavy snow and high winds tumbling over the national Christmas tree in Washington, D.C. Our Rob Marciano is tracking it all. We'll have the forecast in a moment, but first, more on the winter weather sweeping across the country. Tonight, the first major lake effect snow event of the season, bringing whiteout conditions from New York to Ohio. South of Cleveland, multiple pileups, one with serious injuries along I-271. Tractor trailers and other vehicles blocking the highway. And outside Buffalo, it didn't take long for these drivers to get stuck. It's the 219 entrance. It's all messed up. Snowfall rates above two inches an hour in places Strong winds blowing the snow into huge drifts. North of Syracuse, some communities stocked with nearly two feet of snow. Snow removal operations have been in full swing all night and all day. Heavy equipment being brought into the snow zone, removing snow from Main Street and just getting it out of town. Here in Pulaski, we met Michelle Hughes shoveling outside her salon. How heavy is this? I mean, you've been out here for a while. I mean, this uh, is a workout, isn't it? It is. It's quite heavy and it's sticking to my shovel. The coldest air of the season, reaching Washington, D.C., with winds gusting up to 40 miles per hour, toppling the national Christmas tree. The 40-foot Norway spruce from West Virginia coming down just days ahead of Thursday's planned lighting ceremony. Some serious wind there. Rob joins us now. Rob, time this all out for us. Hey, Lindsay. Well, we got snow back here into Syracuse. That band shifted south during the afternoon, and it's been coming down at some point sideways here. Lake effect snow warning remains in effect till at least 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. You see here on the radar, those uh, streamers continue to come off here in Ontario, all the lakes for a matter of fact. But it will wind down, it looks like, tomorrow afternoon. But the cold air tonight, diving all the way down into the south. Freeze warnings posted for Charleston, Tallahassee, Mobile, Baton Rouge, ending the growing season there. And teens and single digits farther north. 
Warming up after that, but another system coming into the west. This one weak to start, but it gets into the plains on Thursday and Friday. Severe storms, maybe some dangerous storms expected southeast Texas and Louisiana then, and then reaching across the Ohio River Valley and into the northeast. Mostly as rain on Friday looks to be a little bit more of a warm storm. There'll be some snow mixed in, but a little bit warmer. Most folks will see as a positive here in the northeast. And Lindsay, we're also getting some positive news. Uh, they did get the national Christmas tree back up vertically, so hopefully. <laughs> ready to be lit here in a couple days. Oh, well, that is good news. We appreciate that. Rob, our thanks to you. Now to the race for the White House and the move by the very influential conservative group Americans for Prosperity Action. We're now putting tens of millions of dollars behind Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley. Here's ABC's new senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. Tonight, a Republican powerhouse, the political organization founded by the billionaire Koch brothers, throwing its support behind former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as the strongest GOP alternative to Donald Trump. It's our time to turn the page and choose a new leader who will unite our party, our nation. That proven leader, Nikki Haley. The group Americas for Prosperity Action, announcing its endorsement just seven weeks before the first votes are cast, insisting Haley would boost Republican candidates up and down the ballot, winning the key independent and moderate voters that Trump has no chance to win. They've already raised $70 million, money that could give Haley new momentum as she rises in the polls. And other candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis slip. We are now in second place in Iowa, second place in New Hampshire, and second place in South Carolina. We just have one more fellow we got to catch up to. That fellow, of course, is Trump, who leads his Republican rivals by more than 40 points in national polls and dismisses Haley's chances. She's going nowhere because she doesn't have what it takes. But the former president himself is facing 91 criminal charges and will likely be on trial in March when the primary is in full swing. Another opponent, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, says Republicans should think long and hard before making Trump the party's nominee. If he is convicted in April or May, which I expect he will be, he will not be able to vote for himself in November. That's who we're going to put on the ballot. What do you think the Democrats are going to talk about? Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, when was the last time the Koch Network endorsed a candidate? Well, the Coat Network has really sat on the sidelines the last two presidential cycles. They did not endorse a candidate in 2016. They did not endorse a candidate in 2020 either. But this time, they say they're willing to go all in on the candidate who has the best chance of beating Donald Trump. They believe that's Nikki Haley, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Embattled New York Congressman George Santos said, I don't care today, ahead of a likely expulsion vote from Congress in the next 48 hours. This latest vote comes after Santos survived two previous attempts to oust him after a scathing House Ethics Committee report outlined his alleged use of campaign funds toward personal expenses, things like Botox treatments, designer goods, and purchases on the adult website OnlyFans. Here's what he had to say today ahead of the looming vote. If this building, if this city put the effort to fixing our country the same way that they put on expelling me, we'd be in a better place. But this place is littered in political theater, and the American people are the ones paying the price. House leaders must schedule an expulsion vote within two legislative days. Now to ABC News exclusive reporting on former Vice President Mike Pence and what he told federal investigators about former President Donald Trump in the days leading up to January 6th. Sources tell ABC News that when Pence spoke with special counsel Jack Smith's team earlier this year, the former VP said that Trump surrounded himself with what Pence described as crank attorneys. ABC News' chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl joins us now live from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. John, uh, tell us what else we're learning from sources about Pence's interview. Well, what you, we see uh, in, in this uh, discussion that Pence had with prosecutors uh, that he spoke at length, chapter and verse, about what happened be between the election which Trump lost and January 6th, <laughs> describing candidly uh, how Trump uh, again became, you know, enthralled with uh, what these, quote, crank lawyers were telling him about election fraud. Pence said he looked, he had his uh, counsel look into whether or not the, any of these allegations had merit, found that he could find no evidence of any kind of fraud that would be big enough to change the results in even a single state, and then talks under oath 
uh, at length about the pressure that Trump put on him day after day after day to use his power, no real power, but power that Trump imagined that Pence had to overturn the election on January 6th. It's really uh, quite detailed, and it gives you a preview, preview, Lindsay, about what Pence will say when he is in the witness stand at an actual trial, which he will be, uh, the election interference trial, which right now is scheduled for March. And that's going to be fascinating to see. ABC News has also yeah. learned that prosecutors asked Pence about notes that he took on the days leading up to January 6th. What do we know about that? Uh, in late December, uh, Pence talks about how he had decided to actually forego the opportunity to preside over the counting of electoral votes on January 6th, decided he just wasn't going to do it. This is what that note reads. Again, this is Pence's own notes in late December, uh, just a uh, less than two weeks before January January 6th. Not feeling I should attend electoral count. Too many questions, too many doubts, too hurtful to my friend. Therefore, I am not going to participate in certification of election. So that was Pence. Uh, again, not that long before uh, January 6th. Obviously, he changed his mind. He ultimately decided to preside over uh, the accounting of the electoral votes. He said that one of the meat key factors in changing his mind was a conversation he had with his son, who was a Marine. And uh, his son said, look, we both took uh, an oath to serve our country. Uh, this is your duty. Uh, you should do it. And Pence ultimately decided, of course, it was his duty. Really interesting information there. Jonathan, Carl, appreciate your reporting as always. Tonight, newly released body camera video shows the aftermath of a deadly bus crash in Licking County, Ohio. Three high school students and three adults were killed when their bus was rear-ended by a semi-truck nearly two weeks ago. Video shows state troopers arriving on the scene, the bus and truck still on fire. Several vehicles were involved. Video also shows one trooper racing inside the bus looking for other possible victims. Investigators released a report detailing what triggered the crash, a chain reaction they believe set off when a semi-truck and SUV then slammed into the bus. Next tonight to the Sterling Memorial for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Her husband of 77 years, former President Jimmy Carter, arrived, although in hospice care himself, he was determined to be there. President Biden, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, the Clintons and Michelle Obama all in attendance. Our senior national correspondent Steve Osinsame reports. At a church in Atlanta, as they respectfully carried Mrs. Rosalind Carter inside, the first row of pews filled with U.S. presidents past and present, and every living former first lady. And then quickly, the world got a rare look at a great American citizen, former President Jimmy Carter, who was in hospice care at home, but refused to miss saying goodbye to his wife of 77 years. Sitting by his side, his son and daughter, they shared their love with kisses and beautiful stories about the woman he called Rose. I will always love my mother. I will cherish how she and dad raised her children. They've given us such a great example of how a couple should relate. And she was my grandmother first, and she was like everyone else's grandmother in a lot of ways. Almost all of her recipes call for mayonnaise, for example. <laughs> But tears fell across the church when their daughter read a letter the former president wrote about her mother 75 years ago while he was in the Navy. My darling, every time I have ever been away from you, I have been thrilled when I returned to discover just how wonderful you are. While I am away, I try to convince myself that you really are not, could not be, as sweet and beautiful as I remember. But when I see you, I fall in love with you all over again. Does that seem strange to you? It doesn't to me. Goodbye, darling. Until tomorrow, Jimmy. What an absolute love story there. Steve Osinsami joins us now from Atlanta. And Steve, so many people turned out today. What struck you most about the memorial service? Oh my goodness, I don't know if I can pick one thing. You know, there was first, of course, seeing the former president come in 
to say goodbye to his wife in front of all these other statesmen, these other former world leaders, there's that. It was also the letter that, uh, you know, her daughter read from her father 75 years ago while he was in the Navy saying how much he hated being apart from his wife. But for me, what I think sticks out the most is the humor. Um, there was a, a comment from their, their grandson where he talked about how his grandmother was like most gr grandmothers and that every recipe she had had mayonnaise. You know, we, <laughs> we understand that in the South. Um, and of course, how she would wash her Ziploc bags, you know, which spoke less about the statesman and the wife of a statesman and the co-founder of the Carter Center, these things that, you know, we know that she has accomplished in her life and spoke more to the real person that they knew. Lindsay. I also loved it when he said that it it wasn't a cane that she had, but an explorer's stick, a walking stick there. But uh, but so many right. fond, fond memories. Steve, our thanks to you. And Rosalind Carter will be buried tomorrow at her home in South Georgia. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. We bring you the story of a dog cured from a mystery illness affecting man's best friend around the country. But next, we bring you a report on the eerie increase of ghost forests and what that signals about our world's climate. I want my daughter, my grandchildren, I want many generations to be able to come here and experience what it's like to, to walk into a forest like this. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. As we speak, delegates from around the world are gathering in Dubai as the United Nations Climate Change Conference prepares to get underway. But here at home, the ramifications of climate change are already being felt. There's no clearer sign of the impacts of climate change than right in our own ghost forest. There are large patches of dead trees and wetlands where evergreens once thrived in these ecosystems. In tonight's Prime Focus, Ginger Z takes us to one ghost forest right in our own backyard for an up-close look at why we could see more of them as climate change is felt around the world. It's the type of quiet few of us ever get a chance to hear. Does this count as my forest bathing? It does, it does. On a sweltering September day, the dense pine lands of New Jersey provide a cool reprieve. This transition from upland into wetland is yeah. critical. You'll feel the difference. And an almost mythical escape. You can feel the softer. 
Yes, you can feel mm -hmm. the kind of spring. Gingerly, we follow ecologist Kathleen Walls' footsteps into this vital and threatened part of our coastline. It's very dry today, but you can still see mm -hmm. the groundwater. The sphagnum moss here will actually, you know, it will, you can squeeze water out of it. Oh, wow. So it's like a sponge. Yeah. Well, it feels like a sponge. It like does. under our feet, it it's feels soft. like. It's soft. It's a little bit bouncy. Yeah. Yeah. So this is part of what makes um, the soil called peat. And so it accumulates and creates this really deep peat that is continually saturated by that groundwater. Mm. It's called the Kirkwood Cohansi Aquifer. Mm -hmm. This really large aquifer in the And that's the one that feeds drinking water to so many in New Jersey. That's correct. Lying just beneath the surface here in South Jersey flows 17 trillion gallons of fresh water. The Kirkwood Cohansi Aquifer spans nearly a third of the entire state, and it's responsible for the drinking water of nearly a million people in South Jersey. But that aquifer is useless without the Atlantic white cedar forest. And unfortunately, fly above us, and that lush, fruitful landscape quickly reveals a harsh reality. Thousands of dead cedars stand eerily and stretch for miles. It's what's known as a ghost forest where the salt water invades the fresh water, rapidly killing swaths of trees. And, and it's so not that the sea level wouldn't have slowly overtaken it, it's just that it's been happening incredibly fast, yeah? It's that it's been happening incredibly fast and that we have so little of this precious resource. Sea level has gone up four inches in 30 years, and it's expected to go up 10 times that by the end of the century. But nearly 100 years ago, New Jersey had more than 125,000 acres of Atlantic white cedar. Today, they're fighting to preserve just 25,000 acres that are left. And it's not all the saltwater's fault. Part of it is because white cedar became one of the main building materials in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Cedar had sort of been picked apart by some of those land management practices or, or land management economic decisions through mm -hmm. the centuries, and then in comes climate change, and that's sort of nipping away at, at that stronghold. We trek through a much younger and shorter Atlantic white cedar forest with New Jersey State Forester Todd Wyckoff. The area devastated by Superstorm Sandy in 2012. This is one of our cedar restoration sites here at Double Trouble State Park. This was a cedar stand that was blown down in Superstorm Sandy. And so this is uh, pretty indicative of our restoration efforts of, of cedar. So what you're seeing here is a, a full crop of, of new growth of cedar trees that through restoration efforts, uh, we're hoping will mature into a, a, a full cedar site. The lessons that they're learning here are being applied to help nature help itself. Is there a threat of not having the Atlantic white cedar here in New Jersey? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons uh, our agency, us as land managers, as stewards of the land, that's what we're here to make sure doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But it's gonna take some effort to make sure that it's in a, in a stable form and in a, in a place where it can um, perpetuate itself on the landscape. It's not just the water filtration that's dependent on the vitality of the forest. These forests also serve as an efficient carbon sink, collecting atmospheric carbon and storing it deep in that peat soil. But it's also home to a vibrant and now threatened ecosystem. So this type of habitat is key to a whole host of species from um, larger predatory birds, to mammals and um, to invertebrates and, and uh, amphibians and reptiles. So without so, the white cedar? Without the white cedar, the pine forest succeeds into this. Um, and then eventually the pine barrens want to turn into uh, uh, like an oak pine mix. And then the longer that that system has uh, no disturbance from fire and things like that, then it turns into a deciduous system. And that changing system has already threatened certain species of snakes, birds, and plants. Just another reason to invest in saving it now. When we're talking about a ghost forest and how quickly we may lose right. an ecosystem like this, why does that matter? The legacy, the legacy of these special places on the landscape, I think of as a living museum. Mm -hmm. You can go to the Museum of the American Museum of Natural History and see panoramas with animals, and you can see dinosaur fossils and minerals. You can go to a botanical garden and see plants. Mm -hmm. But if you want to see how they are, this is the living museum of ecosystems on these protected lands. Mm -hmm.
I want my daughter, my grandchildren, I want many generations to be able to come here and experience what it's like to, to walk into a forest like this. Future generations may be dependent upon that. Our thanks to Ginger for that. Still much more to get to tonight coming up. Are you tired of hearing people crunch their Doritos? We tell you the company's solution to silencing the noise. But next, just how much money did consumers spend on Cyber Monday? We take a look by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Holiday season spending is off to a strong start as sales on Cyber Monday smashed online records. Let's break it all down for you by the numbers. Consumers spent a total of $12.4 billion on Cyber Monday this year. The busiest hour, 10 to 11 p.m. Eastern, when consumers spent 
$15.7 million every minute as shoppers click their way to major discounts in categories like electronics, toys, and apparel. Discounts hit record highs, according to Adobe Analytics, which showed discounts on electronics peaked at 31% off. That's 6% more in savings compared to Cyber Monday last year, though we should note that discounts for toys were not as great. In fact, they actually fell below last year's discount levels. Apparel was also a clear winner on Cyber Monday, with online sales growing 189% compared to an average day last month. And while shoppers were eager to spend money, usage of the buy now, pay later hit an all-time high on Cyber Monday, as Americans opted to pay their $940 million in online spending down the road. And if you're one of the many still out to find a good deal, Adobe predicts deals will linger through the discounts, though, may not be as steep. Just don't forget, 26 full shopping days before the Christmas holiday. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime. We tell you what deals to take advantage of on this Travel Tuesday. And we sit down with film director Baz Luhrmann to discuss his latest project, Far Away Downs. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Hunter Biden offers to testify before Congress. The fallout over Sports Illustrated reportedly using AI writers and the new iPhone feature causing law enforcement concerns. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. A letter from Hunter Biden's attorney casts the House's impeachment inquiry as a fishing expedition that's morphed into a version of Moby Dick, with Captain Ahab chasing a great white whale. Lawyer Abby Lowell says his client will take Chairman James Comer up on his offer to have Hunter Biden testify, but Lowell says the president's son would only be willing to appear in public, and not in a closed deposition, saying the move would, quote, prevent selective leaks and one-sided press statements. The House Oversight Committee chairman responding tonight to Hunter Biden's demand for a public public hearing by saying he should have that opportunity in the future. Lawyers arguing before the Texas Supreme Court that the state's abortion law should be put on hold. 20 women filing suit saying complications with the pregnancies put their lives in danger. Now two physicians have joined that lawsuit and former district court judge Charlie Baird says the state Supreme Court will notice the growing list of plaintiffs. There's a very urgent need they feel to have this statute unenforceable. Texas Governor Greg Abbott had pushed for the fetal heartbeat law. He signed the legislation in May. The owners of Sports Illustrated have denied a report that the publication produced articles written by artificial intelligence under fake author bylines. Futurism originally reported the sports magazine used headshots and biographical information for the supposed AI writers. According to CBS Money Watch Arena Group, which owns Sports Illustrated, said in a statement it had pulled the articles in question, pending an investigation. While finding the articles were in fact written by humans using pseudonames from a third-party company. Privacy advocates voicing concern about a new iPhone feature. It's called Name Drop, and if you've updated your phone to iOS 17, it's on your device. As an Apple YouTube video explains. Tap your contact info, then choose if you'd like to share your phone number or email. The default setting is on, not off, and some police departments have issued warnings to parents to shut down the feature in their kids' phones to keep strangers from grabbing their contact information. Apple stresses both the sender and the recipient must give permission to share data. technology that's changing how we snack. If you're annoyed by that crunch that Doritos make, well, there's now a solution. Doritos has created Doritos Silent. The idea was inspired by people playing video games with headsets who don't want to hear other players chowing down on chips. Rito Silent is a crunch-canceling software generated by artificial intelligence. It removes the sound of chewing from being sent through the headphones. The app is free. Today is Giving Tuesday. Americans are expected to donate over $3.4 billion to their favorite charities to spread holiday cheer. If you're making a donation, it is important to keep these tips in mind. First, check if your employer will match your gift amount. Some companies might have a preferred list of charities. Next, donate directly on the charity's website. Instead of going through a third party, that will ensure that you're giving to the right place. And you want to be sure to save your donation receipt for tax purposes. In case you did not know, today is Travel Tuesday and the best day of the year to find deals on flights, cruises, and hotels. Experts say there are more travel deals today than Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. If you have not booked anything yet for the holidays, Marriott is offering up to 20% off stays through January 15th. Travelers enrolled in loyalty programs for Expedia and Hotels.com can get at least 30% for travel through next year. Experts say flight deals are better than in years past. Well, experts say to save the most, try to be flexible with dates and destinations. Also book directly with hotels and airlines when possible because they usually offer the best savings. Now to the family who says their dog was cured from the mystery illness affecting lots of pups across the country. ABC's Will Reeve has more on what happened and what all pet owners need to know. It was very touch and go. They didn't think he, he was going to make it. This California family is speaking out about their dog's miraculous recovery from that mystery respiratory illness vexing vets nationwide. John and Becky Oliver say their five-year-old golden retriever, Ike, first got sick in September while on the road competing in dog shows. And he really didn't exhibit any symptoms at the beginning. Um maybe a cough here or there. When they took his temperature at the emergency vet hospital in Arizona, they said his fever was 105.3. 
Um, his color wasn't good. Ike developed pneumonia and spent three days in the hospital before the family moved him to a vet clinic closer to home. My son was in the back seat holding oxygen to the dog's face for like six hours driving across the desert. The family bracing for the worst when Becky says she got a message from a woman in the dog show community about a potential treatment, a powerful antibiotic called chloramphenicol. They're saying, try this. And the vet at first was like, oh, no, 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 that's an extremely strong antibiotic, kind of a last-ditch effort antibiotic. And then the internal medicine veterinary, veterinarian came over and said, no, let's try it. Dr. Lindsay Ganser didn't treat Ike, but has seen numerous dogs with this respiratory illness. She says this treatment should only be used when no other options exist. That particular antibiotic is typically used as a last resort. Um, it uh, is one where, you know, we, if... We give it to an owner to give to a dog. They have to handle it with gloves um, so because people can't really touch it. The Olivers say within 12 hours of the first dose, Ike was weaned off oxygen and able to come home later that week. And now they say he's back to his normal self. He looks pretty much the same. And he looks great. And we're just so grateful we can't, we still can't believe he's still here. Our thanks to Will for that. Time tonight for the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting screens worldwide, speaking with some of the actors and creators behind them. Our next guest is known for his illustrious work on iconic films like Elvis, Moulin Rouge, and The Great Gatsby. Baz Luhrmann has been dazzling fans for decades. And now, after 15 years, the director is revisiting his romantic, historical, epic Australia and turning it into Far Away Downs, a six-part series on Hulu, once again starring Nicole Cole Kidman and Hugh Jackman. The restructure of the 2008 film comes with all new footage. Here's a look. There's a half-blood Aboriginal child out here somewhere. Run! I thought we might put him in the good hands of the church. Get off my property! To save this house? I need money. Out here, your cattle's worth more than your land. Run! Move on! What are you doing? Move. Crikey. And Baz, kind enough to join us now in studio. Thanks so much for coming Lindsay. on. So the theme here, the idea of these Aboriginal children who yeah. were forcibly removed from their homes in yeah. the late 19, 1800s into the 1900s. Right, into 1970, actually. It was oh, is still that happening right? even then, yeah. And, and you partner with an Indigenous uh, director here as well. Yeah, uh, creators, some directors, a team, a whole community, actually. How important was their input in the telling of this story? Well, you know, it was everything. I mean, what I wanted to do was take a sort of old-fashioned movie style, you know, sort of melodrama, sweeping romance, you know, big cattle drive, but put in it this incredibly painful and really mm. horrendous scar in the history of Australia where mixed-race children were forcibly taken around, put in compounds, broken up from their families and open the door onto the subject. And, you know, um, they were profoundly involved. Why revisit Australia? You know, I say blame Tom Hanks, because uh, we're about to shoot Elvis, and Tom very famously gets COVID. And then we're shut down, and I think Elvis is not going to be made, and I think, well, what am I going to do? And I started to look back into the footage and realise that, you know, I made Australia, it's a standalone movie, but there was this streaming had come along, you know, and it allowed for epic storytelling. I thought, well, I could really lean into this theme about this story being told from an Indigenous child's point of view and really expand on it. And so I started to look into it. I had 2.1 million feet of footage and I was able to make it. And so what did you decide, based on that original uh, movie that you did in 2008, that, okay, we're going to change the ending yeah. or we're going to use this new yeah, footage, yeah. we're going to keep the old? How did you decide? Yeah, well, that's, 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 that's the thing. It's not just Australia with a bit of spice thrown mm -hmm. on it. I mean, there's different plot points in it. One of the exciting things was I got to work with these young Indigenous pop stars like, you know, contemporary music and do whole new music to it. And that's... That was a thrill, and um, young Indigenous graphic artists, but also to allow Nicole's character, spend more time with that, in her revelation of becoming the woman that she is in this man's world. And I think the big change in the ending allows that. It speaks to the theme, which is what drove her. Hugh Jackman's character says is, you know, you can't control, you can't own land, you can't own a child, you can't own a relationship. All you got in the end is your story. 
and you better live a good one. And that, I think, we were able to dig into in a real deep way. Does someone have to see Australia first in no. order to appreciate the series? No, in fact, I think they stand alone. You know, it's a bit like doing a variation on a song. Same song, but mm -hmm. doing it in a different way. Right at the beginning of this series, you have a, a disclaimer to, that pays respect to the native Aboriginal people. How important was that for you to, to honor their heritage? It's everything. I mean, you know, I come, came from that part of the world. I lived up there for two years. Um, the community is super important. It was one of the great privileges for myself, my family, to be part of the community as we made this story with them. Not about them, but with them. What would you like people to take away from it? I hope that idea, look, look. I, when I made the film 15 years ago, the world was one thing. But if the idea is you really can't, you know, control land, a child, a relationship, we just don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, look at the world we're in. There's this just incredible feeling of no one knows anything. But what you can do, is live your story. And that means look at your circumstances, live in the moment, you know, own your story. Baz Lerman, what a, a joy to, to have you here with us on set. Really appreciate it. And want to let our viewers know that you can watch the new series Far Away Downs right now, streaming on Hulu. And tonight, while millions of Americans are facing a cold front kicking in, it may feel like the right time to look at some warm travel destinations. And it is reportedly the best day of the year to find deals on flights, cruises, accommodations, and any travel-related purchase you can imagine. We're digging a bit further into what we teased in the rundown, the day being dubbed Travel Tuesday. ABC's DeMarco Morgan has more. Travel Tuesday is taking off. Your next vacation may be just a click away. We're expecting to see more deals available today than on Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. Whether you are looking for a trip with the family. Yes. We know Big Ben. Parliament. Or a weekend with your closest friends. You don't have to break the bank. Hotels are slashing prices. If you haven't booked anything yet for the holidays, Marriott offering up to 20% off through today only with stays through January 15th. Travelers enrolled in Expedia and Hotel.com's free one key program can get at least 30% for travel through 2024. Want to explore Europe? Hopper is offering hotel deals too. We're going to be offering up to 50% off hotels exclusively on the Hopper app in destinations like Rome and Paris. Experts say flight deals are better than years past. Because the airline industry is slowing down. Airfares are starting to come down. And something we would have never thought a year ago, airlines struggling to fill seats. Southwest offering 30% off. And Frontier's All You Can Fly and Go Pass extended through today at its lowest price of $499. Hopper says more than 100 of its airline partners will offer deals today, including these low fares. New York's LaGuardia to Orlando, $50 round trip. Chicago to San Juan for $160 round trip. And Los Angeles to Rome for as low as $480 round trip. But if an ocean breeze is more your style, Virgin Voyages offering up to 30% off one of many cruise lines discounting trips. MSC Cruises are an up-and-comer. They're offering really robust deals. Holland America is also offering 30% off select cruises. Nice deals there. Our thanks to DeMarco for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. next hour, we bring you images of the memorial service for former First Lady Rosalind Carter and the wife of a spy chief poisoned with heavy metals. We'll tell you where coming up. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Mike, the situation. What a situation that guy was. There was upwards of 10 naked, beautiful women in my room at one particular time. I was probably a good six Percocet 30s deep while on live TV. I've been through some really tough times. The situation, drugs and sex on the Jersey Shore. People think they know about the situation. You have no idea. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including a fifth hostage transfer between Israel and Hamas taking place as talks are said to be underway to further extend the truce. Plus, they're one of the most powerful conservative groups in Republican politics, and they've just endorsed someone other than Donald Trump, who the Coke-backed Americans for Prosperity just endorsed for 2024 and why. And his book about the royal family is making headlines as rifts and secrets are exposed. Royal writer Omid Scobie joins us. But we do begin with that tentative pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas and the 12 additional hostages freed today. Ten of them are Israelis, two foreign nationals, one is a minor, the rest are women. And on the Israeli side, the government released 30 more Palestinian prisoners as we get images of celebrations in the West Bank. Tonight, with nine Americans still reportedly being held hostage, U.S. officials say there is no indication Hamas is using the Americans as leverage. And the White House says 54,000 pounds of aid was delivered by plane to Egypt today, which will ultimately make its way into Gaza. Then two more planes will follow. Even with the pause in fighting, the situation inside Gaza remains dire. Roughly two million people have been displaced. And tonight, there is some hope that more hostages will be released. We begin with our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, on the ground for us once again in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Tonight, Hamas militants walking each of those 12 hostages to the Red Cross, among them 17-year-old Mia Leenberg, seen here clutching her pet dog, Bella, both surviving captivity together. Mia kidnapped along with her mother, Gabriella, seen here tonight holding each other close. The women, at least one in a wheelchair, carefully loaded into those Red Cross vehicles, which then squeezed through crowds near Gaza's border with Egypt, then driven into Israel. In exchange, Israel releasing 30 more Palestinians from its jails. Notably missing again tonight, any Americans. The FBI believes nine citizens are still in captivity in Gaza, including two women, and no word on where they're being held or which group is holding them.
Tonight, CIA Director Bill Burns holding high-level talks in Qatar, pushing for a hostage deal, including Americans. In Israel, emotional reunions like Thomas Hand's hug of his daughter Emily, followed by the trauma. Tonight, Thomas telling CNN, Emily cries herself to sleep and thought she was in captivity for a year. The most shocking, disturbing part of the meeting was um, she was just whispering. Mm. Couldn't hear. I had to put my ear on her lips, like this close, and say, what did you say? And she I thought you were kidding. She didn't know what the hell happened apart from that morning. So she's presumed everyone's kidnapped or killed or slaughtered or she had no idea. In Tel Aviv tonight, a rally, balloons lofted skyward, demanding the release of the two youngest hostages, 10-month-old Kfir, 4-year-old Aviv, and their mother, Shiri Bibas, seen here being taken captive on October 7th. And like every hostage family, every night, Shiri's cousin, Yafat Zaylor Paz, gets a call from the IDF telling her whether those babies are on the list. And he calls me a few times a day, and I can't breathe. Even just to update on other things, and I can't breathe. No one seen or heard from them, but Yifat still hopeful for their release. In the West Bank tonight, a jubilant homecoming for those newly released Palestinians. Our Ines de la Cutera is there. You can see people here running to meet that bus down there, carrying the new group of Palestinian prisoners. Uh, this clearly feels like a giant celebration. Teen brothers Kassam and Nasrallah, who served 17 months in an Israeli prison, released Sunday, accused of supporting terrorism, which they both deny. We sat down with them, Kassam saying he was only given 30 minutes notice before his release and remained in shock until the moment he arrived home. Our thanks to Matt for that. Now to the fallout here at home where Iranian-backed hackers have claimed responsibility for a cyber attack on a water system near Pittsburgh. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, evidence that hackers with ties to Iran may be testing the American infrastructure for vulnerabilities. Officials at a small water utility site in Pennsylvania just outside of Pittsburgh Noticed Friday night that a computer that helps control water pressure for two townships was malfunctioning. When they rebooted the system, this ominous message, highlighted in red, appeared on the screen, saying, you have been hacked. One strategy used by hacking groups is to start small, target a vulnerable location, and then use that to conduct additional cyber attacks in the future. The group claiming responsibility called themselves Cyber Avengers, saying they were attacking because the water utility used equipment made in Israel. It's mind-blowing. I would have never, in, my, in a million years, I would have never thought that we could be involved in that. Utility officials say the hack did not impact the main computer network and at no time was water quality or supply at risk. But tonight, ABC News obtaining this bulletin from state and federal officials warning that this form of attack has the potential to target any critical infrastructure in our area. Very concerning. Our thanks to Pierre for that. Depending on where you live, if you step outside tonight, it certainly may feel like winter is here. We are tracking the first major lake effect snow of the season, and temperatures have plunged for millions. In Lake County, Ohio, it is not the night to be on the roads. More than a dozen vehicles involved in a massive pileup in heavy snow and high winds tumbling over the national Christmas tree in Washington, D.C. Our Rob Marciano is tracking it all. We'll have the forecast in a moment, but first, more on the winter weather sweeping across the country. Tonight, the first major lake effect snow event of the season, bringing whiteout conditions from New York to Ohio. South of Cleveland, multiple pileups, one with serious injuries along I-271. Tractor trailers and other vehicles blocking the highway. And outside Buffalo, it didn't take long for these drivers to get stuck. It's the 219 entrance. It's all messed up. Snowfall rates above two inches an hour in places. Strong winds blowing the snow into huge drifts. North of Syracuse, some communities socked with nearly two feet of snow. Snow removal operations have been in full swing all night and all day. Heavy equipment being brought into the snow zone, removing snow from Main Street and just getting it out of town. Here in Pulaski, we met Michelle Hughes shoveling outside her salon. How heavy is this? I mean, you've been out here for a while. I mean, this uh, is a workout, isn't it? It is. It's quite heavy and it's sticking to my shovel. 
The coldest air of the season, reaching Washington, D.C., with winds gusting up to 40 miles per hour, toppling the national Christmas tree. The 40-foot Norway spruce from West Virginia coming down just days ahead of Thursday's planned lighting ceremony. Some serious wind there. Rob joins us now. Rob, time this all out for us. Hey, Lindsay. Well, we got snow back here into Syracuse. That band shifted south during the afternoon, and it's been coming down at a point sideways here. Lake effect snow warning remains in effect till at least 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. You see here on the radar, those uh, streamers continue to come off Erie and Ontario, all the lakes for a matter of fact. But it will wind down, it looks like, tomorrow afternoon. But the cold air tonight, diving all the way down into the south. Freeze warnings posted for Charleston, Tallahassee, Mobile, Baton Rouge, ending the growing season there in teens and single digits farther north. Warming up after that, but another system coming into the west. This is one week to start, but it gets into the plains on Thursday and Friday. Severe storms, maybe some dangerous storms expected southeast Texas and Louisiana then, and then reaching across the Ohio River Valley and into the northeast. Mostly as rain on Friday looks to be a little bit more of a warm storm. There'll be some snow mixed in, but a little bit warmer. Most folks will see as a positive here in the northeast. And, Lindsay, we're also getting some positive news. Uh, they did get the national Christmas tree back up vertically, so hopefully... <laughs> ready to be lit here in a couple days. Oh, well, that is good news. We appreciate that. Rob, our thanks to you. In Ohio tonight, police have released harrowing images showing the aftermath of a deadly crash involving a bus carrying high school students. Here's Alex Perez. New video tonight from the Ohio State Highway Patrol showing the chaotic and heart-pounding moments just outside Columbus shortly after a charter bus carrying high school band students was struck and burst into flames. Let's get out! One officer sprinting into action, grabbing a fire extinguisher from his cruiser. Anyone! Helping to pull one victim from an SUV, then rushing onto that still burning bus, searching for survivors. What about the driver? The, anyone in there? I have no idea. I got here and it already happened. In all, six killed, three students and three chaperones who were in a different vehicle. And just today, investigators releasing a report detailing what triggered the crash, a chain reaction they believe set off when a semi struck an SUV and then slammed into the bus. And Lindsay, tests show the driver of that semi truck did not have drugs or alcohol in his system. The NTSB is investigating this crash. Lindsay? Alex, thank you. Now to the race for the White House and the move by the very influential conservative group Americans for Prosperity Action, who are now putting tens of millions behind Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley. Here's ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, a Republican powerhouse, the political organization founded by the billionaire Koch brothers, throwing its support behind former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as the strongest GOP alternative to Donald Trump. It's our time to turn the page and choose a new leader who will unite our party, our nation. That proven leader, Nikki Haley. The group Americas for Prosperity Action, announcing its endorsement just seven weeks before the first votes are cast, insisting Haley would boost Republican candidates up and down the ballot, winning the key independent and moderate voters that Trump has no chance to win. They've already raised $70 million, money that could give Haley new momentum as she rises in the polls. And other candidates like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis slip. We are now in second place in Iowa, second place in New Hampshire, and second place in South Carolina. We just have one more fellow we got to catch up to. That fellow, of course, is Trump who leads his Republican rivals by more than 40 points in national polls and dismisses Haley's chances. She's going nowhere because she doesn't have what it takes. But the former president himself is facing 91 criminal charges and will likely be on trial in March when the primary is in full swing. Another opponent, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, says Republicans should think long and hard before making Trump the party's nominee. If he is convicted in April or May, which I expect he will be, he will not be able to vote for himself in November. That's who we're going to put on the ballot. What do you think the Democrats are going to talk about? 
Our thanks to Rachel. Embattled New York Congressman George Santos said, I don't care today ahead of a likely expulsion vote from Congress in the next 48 hours. This latest vote comes after Santos survived two previous attempts to oust him after a scathing House Ethics Committee report outlined his alleged use of campaign funds toward personal expenses, things like Botox treatments, designer goods, and purchases on the adult website OnlyFans. Here's what he had to say today ahead of the looming vote. If this building, if this city put the effort to fixing our country the same way that they put on expelling me, we'd be in a better place. But this place is littered in political theater, and the American people are the ones paying the price. House leaders must schedule an expulsion vote within two legislative days. Next tonight, to the stirring of memorial for former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Her husband of 77 years, former President Jimmy Carter, arrived, although in hospice care himself, he was determined to be there. President Biden, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden, the Clintons, and Michelle Obama all in attendance. Our senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami reports. <laughs> At a church in Atlanta, as they respectfully carried Mrs. Rosalind Carter inside, the first row of pews filled with U.S. presidents past and present, and every living former first lady. And then quickly, the world got a rare look at a great American citizen, former President Jimmy Carter, who was in hospice care at home, but refused to miss saying goodbye to his wife of 77 years. Sitting by his side, his son and daughter, they shared their love with kisses and beautiful stories about the woman he called Rose. I will always love my mother. I will cherish how she and dad raised her children. They've given us such a great example of how a couple should relate. And she was my grandmother first, and she was like everyone else's grandmother in a lot of ways. Almost all of her recipes call for mayonnaise, for example. <laughs> But tears fell across the church when their daughter read a letter the former president wrote about her mother 75 years ago while he was in the Navy. My darling, every time I have ever been away from you, I have been thrilled when I returned to discover just how wonderful you are. While I am away, I try to convince myself that you really are not, could not be, as sweet and beautiful as I remember. But when I see you, I fall in love with you all over again. Does that seem strange to you? It doesn't to me. Goodbye, darling. Until tomorrow, Jimmy. Such an enduring love story. Our thanks to Steve for that. And we still have much more to get to tonight. Coming up, 41 construction workers have been rescued from a collapsed tunnel after 17 days. But next, we take you inside the lives of the royal family with Omid Scobie, who details the chaos and distrust among the royal family in his new book. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Buckingham Palace, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The wife of Ukraine's spy chief has been poisoned with heavy metals and is undergoing treatment at a hospital, according to an agency spokesperson. The victim is the wife of a lieutenant general who is the head of Ukraine's military intelligence agency. The agency spokesperson has released very few details about what happened. It is not saying if she was the intended target or if the agency believes Russia is behind the alleged poisoning. Rescuers in northern India have freed 41 construction workers who've been trapped inside a collapsed tunnel for more than two weeks. The men were greeted with loud cheers and garlands of marigold flowers. Officials say the trapped workers all made it through the ordeal in good health because they had access to food, water, and oxygen through pipes. And Virgin Atlantic just became the first airline to power a transatlantic flight using 100% green fuel. The Boeing 787 passenger jet dubbed Flight 100 departed London's Heathrow Airport and landed at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport earlier today. The fuel was a blend of mostly processed cooking oil and other fats. Virgin Atlantic's billionaire founder Richard Branson said, the world will always assume something cannot be done until you do it. It is the most famous family in the world. With no shortage of drama, the British royals have found themselves the subject of intrigue for millions. Now in his new book, ABC News royal contributor Omid Scobie is pulling back the curtain in Endgame inside the royal family and the monarchy's fight for survival. Omid, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be here in the studio. Good to have you in person. So you write that this really could be uh, the family in crisis and potentially the Endgame. I mean, would there be at all a situation where the monarchy as we know it ceases to exist? Yeah, I'm glad you used that, that term as we know it because I think a lot of people think that I'm declaring the end of the royal institution. Listen, it's so deeply embedded into the foundations and every facet of British life that dismantling that would be a mammoth task. But I think we have reached this pinnacle moment where after the death of the Queen, more people are having conversations about the relevancy, the purpose of the royal family, but also, you know, the passing of the queen, the late queen, reminded us of how she skillfully upheld the values, the morals, the ethics, and the principles that we expected from a firm, an institution at the head of our country that represents Britain on the world stage, those famous British family values. Um, on display and you know, I really wanted this book to question and look into whether the current working royals and all the events that we've seen in recent years also uphold those same principles or are there things that need to change in order to solidify that positive future for the firm? You also detail years later the fallout that continues from that bombshell moment in Oprah's famous yeah. interview with Meghan Markle where it's brought up that there was a, a member of the royal family who had concerns about the color of the baby's skin. What was the family's reaction to that? Yeah. You know, I think we spent so long talking about uh, that bombshell piece of information that Harry and Meghan brought up, but I wanted to go a little deeper than that. Firstly, I wanted to know why we haven't heard about it since. Harry and Meghan have done a Netflix series. Harry did a memoir, and we didn't hear those allegations brought up. I realized that these this was considered or classed as a private family matter. We sort of remember that recollections may vary statement from the palace. But ultimately, this is an establishment that should be uh, representative for every member of British society. And what was more worrying was to discover that there were two family members at the heart of that conversation. So it still remains unresolved. The Daily Mail, though, is reporting that in a Dutch version, it names King Charles as being at least one of those people who raised concerns about the skin color. I'm, I'm curious if you have any understanding of how that happened, yeah. this misnomer, and, and also the context of the conversation. Yeah, 
you know, this is an, this translation error that you refer to is an incident that happened just hours before being here in the studio. And as I'm aware that it's being dealt with by the Dutch publisher. You know, I wrote this book in English, I edited it in English, and it's been published by in the US and UK by HarperCollins. And you know, for us, there were no names in the manuscript. Even if you so. knew, you would not be able to. And you do know, but you're not. I know, reading. yeah. But you would not be able to publish it in the book, correct? The laws in the UK require to be, for one to be able to show and tell. I can tell, but I can't present those letters. They're not mine. So the power really lies in Harry and Meghan's hands. You've been accused of being a mouthpiece for the Sussexes. <laughs> How do you respond to that criticism? I think with me, it's always been this kind of like lazy way of delegitimizing what I have to say by just as assuming that this comes from the mouths of Harry and Meghan. I have never in my life sat with Meghan in a room and had an interview, a private conversation, exchange notes. None of this stuff is true. Lastly, obviously, we're well aware of the rift between uh, the princes Harry and, and William. Where does their relationship stand today? Yeah, you know, the release of Harry's memoir, Spare, was almost a year ago now. And I didn't want this book to kind of retread the stories that Harry had told us, but I did want to pick up where it left off. You know, he sat down on GMA and spoke about how he wanted uh, conversations with his family to recon reconcile after accountability and apologies have taken place. None of that has happened, particularly between himself and William. I know through sources he had someone, a mutual friend, reach out to his brother to see if they could facilitate some kind of conversation a few months after the release of his book. To this day, that still hasn't happened. Omid Scobie, always a pleasure to Thank talk you. with you. I want to let our viewers know Endgame Inside the Royal Family and the Monarchy's Fight for Survival is now available wherever books are sold. We should mention both Buckingham Palace and Kensington Palace declined to comment on Scobie's book to ABC News. We also reached out to the Sussex for comment as well. And still to come, pen pals finally meet after decades of friendship. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. What started as a project in the fifth grade grew into a lifelong friendship. And now two pen pals who managed to stay in touch for four decades are finally getting the chance to meet face to face. Our partner station WPVI in Philadelphia brings us along for the reunion in tonight's local lowdown. Hi! Oh my God. How are you? For us to be from two different schools, two different states, two different sides of the country, you know, and be friends 43 years later. Only difference is now we've been in the same place at the same time is all. Um, Need some time to do some math. Fourth grade was nine to 10, 10 years old. I can't believe we were that young. In our fifth grade class had this project where they were writing to another class in Pennsylvania. And then you were in California. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they were probably hoping that we would stay connected or, you know, or continue on with it. Please write or email me back. So much to catch up on. We did, and I always said one day, we're gonna meet, and here we are. And here we are, 40 years ago. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to go there, do we? We wrote by hand letters 
for a long time. Dear Haley, do you have a best friend? Does it snow where you are? I think we thought about each other, you know, whether we were in contact or not. I got married, had a son, my mom passed, she lost her father, and then uh, Facebook came to be and that's when yeah. it went digital. <laughs> there was definitely breaks in there, yeah. you know, but we always... We always stayed in touch in some way. Some way. Really fascinating, lifelong friendship there. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in.